When we think about crucifixion, I would guess that we most often, if not always, associate it with Jesus, right? And rightfully so. But really, for those who were living in the Roman Empire, crucifixions were a regular daily part of life. And this type of torture and punishment certainly wasn't unique to Jesus. The cross at this time was considered to be the cruelest, the most painful, and the most humiliating form of capital punishment known to humanity. And its goal in being a very public form of execution was that it would act as a punishment, but also as a deterrent. It wasn't created by the Romans, but it was actually the Persians that first came up with this demented idea. And it was seen by the Romans as being so terrible that it was reserved for slaves, and on only very rare occasions was it used for Roman citizens. It was so terrible that the word excruciating was invented to describe the immense pain that the victims of this type of execution would experience. And make no mistake, it was adopted by the Romans as a means of crowd control. They felt that if a, a public spectacle was made of the guilty person, that it would deter others from even thinking about committing the crime. As part of the Roman crucifixion, the accused would first face a beating of 39 lashes of a, a cat of nine tails. This was a specialized whip with pieces of glass and bone tied to the end, and it would gouge out pieces of flesh with each lash. In fact, about 25% of the condemned would actually die during this part of the process. After the whipping, the condemned person would then be forced to carry either the cross piece or the entire cross through the streets to the place where they were to be crucified. They would land, then lay the cross down on the ground and the condemned would be placed on it. Their arms would be tied to the cross piece to prevent the nail holes from enlarging and the condemned person falling off the cross. Nails would then first be driven through the hands, followed by their feet being crossed, and then they too would be nailed to the cross. Sometimes, but not always, the Romans would place a small platform for the feet to rest on, and they did this so that the criminals would take longer to die. The cross would then be turned over and the nails bent in order to make sure that they didn't pull out. They would then place a, a sign either above the condemned or around his neck that would identify the charge that he was convicted of. And often the individual's name would also be placed on that sign as a way of shaming their family. They would then hoist the cross into place using ropes. It would be dropped into a hole usually about two feet deep and then secured with rocks. The drop into the hole would pull and strain every muscle in the accused person's body. Now, death on the cross was a long and slow process that often took several days. The fact that Jesus was only on the cross for about six hours probably tells us how bad his condition was before going on to the cross. And the person hanging on the cross was always at the mercy of the elements, animals, and insects, as well as the constant taunting from the crowd. The actual death would usually come by way of suffocation, shock, loss of blood, or from the effects of the beating inflicted before the crucifixion. And Jesus faced all of this and much more on the day that he went to the cross. He knew that the cross was a necessity for God's ultimate plan of salvation and that the Passover was the ordained time at which he had been asked to sacrifice his life by his heavenly father. Now, you might be wondering why our Easter celebration, our Resurrection Sunday, is starting off with a reminder of the events of Good Friday. You might be wondering why the focus so far has been on the crucifixion rather than on his resurrection. You might even be wondering why I've just focused on the last hours of Jesus' life rather than his coming back to life. And I shared this first because I think that we often forget that salvation that day was manifested first by one of the thieves that was hanging beside Jesus. I think that we often skim over the fact that there were three crosses at Calvary on that day that Christ died. And those three crosses in many ways represent the spiritual position of the entire world. 
because the two crosses on either side of Jesus represent the two ways in which people choose to die in relation to their sin. There's a cross representing those who choose not to come to Christ, and there is a cross for those who choose to turn to him for salvation. And hung between those two was the cross of Christ, ready to offer both the same gift of life. But it's fascinating to think about how those two other men responded. These two thieves went through the same painful process that Jesus did. For most of us, when we think about the thieves on the cross, we usually don't give them much more than an afterthought. And yet they responded so differently to Jesus, didn't they? One chose to insult Jesus and the other, in his pain, asked for forgiveness. One stayed angry and bitter to the end, and the other had a moment of realization about their sin and asked for forgiveness. And let's be honest. One died paying the eternal price for their own sin. The other understood in some very simple way that Jesus held his future in his hands. Historical sources tell us that their names were Dismas and Gestos, but we really have no way of knowing whether that's true or not. I mean, perhaps they had families and they committed these crimes to put food on their tables. You know, maybe they were desperate. Maybe they had no other option. Maybe they were career criminals. We just have no way of knowing that. Gestos and Desmos are actually the apocryphal names that were given to these two thieves. The names first show up in this apocryphal book named The Gospel of Nicodemus that was written in around the 4th century. Gestos was the mocking thief and Dismas was said to be the repentant thief. The legend is told from this old and uh, somewhat questionable writing that when Mary and Joseph and Jesus were fleeing to Egypt, that they were attacked by this band of thieves. And you guessed it, among these thieves was Dismas and Gestos. Desmos realized that there was something very different about this family, and he offered the other thieves 40 groats, which is something kind of like oatmeal to us. He offered them these 40 groats to leave this family alone. And the other thieves accepted that. As a result, Jesus was said to have predicted Dismas that he would eventually find salvation and Gestos would eventually find damnation. At best, this is a, an interesting folklore, but nothing more than that. But what we do know is that at the beginning of their journey towards death on the cross, they needed to deal with the man who was hanging between them. You know, the worst offender was often hung in the middle. The criminal that was believed to have committed the worst offense towards the Roman Empire received center stage. And isn't it interesting that the thief on the left of Jesus, I mean, he went down swinging and he chose to join the crowd in mocking Jesus. In fact, he blasphemed Christ, saying, save yourself and us if you truly are the Christ. And right to the end, we see him taking no ownership for why he was there. There's no repentance. There's no taking ownership for his crime. And there's no remorse. This man chose to die in his own sin. The thief on Jesus' right was very different than that, though. In fact, he admits to Jesus that he knows that he's getting what he deserves. He knew that if he got caught committing the crime, that the logical penalty for what he did was this. And what's so interesting about this brief encounter with Jesus is that he actually at one point defends Jesus. The New American Standard puts it this way. He says, we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our crimes. But this man has done nothing wrong. The NIV puts it this way. We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. J.B. Phillips' translation puts it this way. Aren't you afraid of God even when you're getting the same punishment as he is? And it's fair enough for us as we are guilty and we are getting what we deserve, but this man never did anything wrong in his life. And the message puts it this way. 
It says, have you no fear of God? You're getting the same as him. We deserve this, but not him. He has done nothing to deserve this. And I love Jesus' re- response to him. It's so interesting because he knows that this man understands what it is that he deserves. The man says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answers him and says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And true repentance acknowledges the justice of God for the punishment of our sin. And this criminal hanging on the cross has this moment where he catches a glimpse of who Jesus is. And it can be hard to understand his transformation because he never prays the sinner's prayer. He never asks Jesus to come into his heart. There's no walking down the aisle or a public profession of faith, is there? In fact, as we might define salvation, most of us might be left somewhat confused by what's just happened here. I just love how Alistair Begg puts it. Watch this. Without the preaching of the cross, without preaching the cross to ourselves all day and every day, we will very, very quickly revert to faith plus works as the ground of our salvation. So that to go to the old uh, Fort Lauderdale question, if you were to die tonight and, and, and you were getting entry into heaven, what would you say? If you answer that, and if I answer it in the first person, we've immediately gone wrong. Because I, because I believed, because I have faith, because I am this, because I am continuing. Loved ones, the only proper answer is in the third person, because he, because he. Think about the thief on the cross. And what an immense, I I, I can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because you were, you were, you were, you were cussing the guy out with your friend. You've never been in a Bible study. You never got baptized. You never, you didn't know a thing about church membership. And, and yet, and yet you made it. You made it. How did you make it? That's what the angel must have said, you know, like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. What what do you mean you don't know? Well, because I don't know. Well, you know, excuse me, let me get my supervisor. They go get the supervisor, Ranger. So we have just a few questions for you, first of all. Are you, are, you, are, you, are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? <laughs> the guy said, I've never heard of it in my life. And, and what about, uh, let's just go to the doctrine of Scripture immediately. This guy's just staring. And eventually, in frustration, he says, on, on what basis are you here? And he said, the man on the middle cross said, I can come. <laughs> now, now, that's the... That is the only answer. That is the only answer. And if I don't preach the gospel to myself all day and every day, then I will find myself beginning to trust myself, trust my experience, which is part of my fallenness as a man. If I take my eyes off the cross, I can then give only lip service to its efficacy, while at the same time living as if my salvation depends upon me, and as soon as you go there, it will lead you either to abject despair or a horrible kind of arrogance. And it is only the cross of Christ that deals both with the dreadful depths of despair and the pretentious arrogance of the pride of man that says, you know, I can figure this out and I'm doing wonderfully well. No, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. That's why Luther says most of your Christian life is outside of you in this sense that we know that we're not saved by good works. 
We're not saved as a result of our professions, but we're saved as a result of what Christ has achieved. I just love that. We are saved on the basis of what Christ has achieved. And I have to believe that this is what we're supposed to be learning from this whole painful and yet hopeful dialogue between Jesus and this thief. My friends, it's not about you. It's not about what you've accomplished. It's, it's not about how much you know. It's not about coming to church. It's not about going to prayer meetings and singing in the choir. It's not about any human merit. It has everything to do with what Christ did on the cross. And that's what the empty tomb means. And anything else that we try and add to that is just plain arrogance on our part. It's not about what you can do. It's about what Christ did. Do you know what both of these thieves have in common with you and I? We're all guilty. And it's only by what the man in the middle cross did that we can find any kind of hope for our future. Would you bow with me as we pray? Lord, we truly have so much to celebrate today. This is Resurrection Sunday, a day when we look into the tomb and find that you are no longer there, that death could not keep you down. And Jesus, I pray that even today as we've spent time looking at the the dialogues that you had with the thieves that you were crucified beside, Lord, there's so much for us to learn from that. We can learn, Lord, that we all have a choice. We have the choice to die and, and take our sins with us and to pay the price ourselves for that, or we can embrace who you are and what your death means. And Lord, that is truly a day of celebration for those of us who have done that. I pray for those who are listening to this. If there are those who have not made that decision, Jesus, maybe today is the day that you're prompting them and convicting them to do exactly what that thief on the cross did. And that's to acknowledge their sin. And what a beautiful picture it is that you said to him that that day he would be joining you in his kingdom. Truly a reason for us to celebrate Jesus. And we thank you for that truth. In your name we pray. Amen.